my intention is to uh, give some insight into what makes very young children vulnerable when they have an accidental head injury so in addition to that i also at towards the end of my presentation i would like to deal with some aspects of initial assessment of minor head injury in very young children now when one looks at outcome of moderate to severe head injury in very young children we think by intuition that the immature brain is more capable of recovery and regeneration after trauma so that is what we think so is the outcome of head injury better in younger children so that is the issue now when you look at data from several studies by contrast the outcomes are poorest in the 0 to 6 year age group so we need to find out why what is the reason is it just a matter of size or are there more reasons why the outcome is poor there's emerging evidence that the age at injury significantly affects both the nature of the injury and the response of the brain to trauma so there there is enough evidence about that what is important to realize is that in these young children the brain injury occurs during a rapid phase of anatomical and functional development and in this age group the mechanisms of injury are unique the biomechanical properties of the skull brain and neck muscles are unique and the brain has unique pathophysiological responses to trauma and this impact on the markers of brain injury in the sense of clinical assessment lesions that you see on imaging and other manifestations such as increase in intracranial pressure then the efficacy of therapies and finally the outcome and prognosis now it's important to understand the process of maturation of the brain which occurs in a rapid phase from 0 to 6 years to look at mri scan at a 6 day old child compared to the 6 month and adult the progressive lowering of intensity in the white matter in the young child the white matter is hyper intense because there's a lot of water and the water gets replaced by myelin with age and finally in the adult you get the black white matter which is due to myelin so that shows the changes of myelinization parallel to that there is white matter development and establishment of white matter fibers and synapses which are very important and these in turn lead to development of networks in the brain now we know that functions in the brain are due to complex networks and these networks become more complex and more diverse with increasing age now the myelination is important for efficient transfer of information in the brain and the brain networks play a very important role in complex functions such as memory speech concentration so head injury has an adverse impact on neuronal maturation and in turn neuronal maturation impacts the course of head injury so that's that's the role of neuronal maturation in head injury now when you look at general pathophysiology of traumatic brain injury you have primary brain injury which is initial injury that occurs at the moment of impact or when you are hit that results in skull fracture hematomas diffuse injury which are mostly seen in the ct scan macroscopic injury parallel to that you have a cascade of molecular and biochemical and chemical changes and inflammation which we call secondary brain injury which progresses from the initial time of the injury and that results in cerebral swelling cell death impaired capillary blood flow edema and in the arterioles loss of artery regulation and spasm which can cause ischemia so from the initial moment of injury you have a cascade of changes that follows with time and this is a figure showing what happens in the capillary the capillary endothelial cells swell and block the capillary lumen and the astrocytes swell and block the capillary from outside in addition there is increased capillary permeability that allows the the plasma to escape from the capillaries now these changes result in brain swelling increase in intracranial pressure brain herniations and ischemia on top of that you have secondary brain insults that aggravate these changes in the form of hypoxia hypotension 
and seizure, so that there is a vicious cycle that forms. Secondary brain insults increase the brain swelling and ischemia, that increases intracranial pressure. So you have a vicious cycle, which is difficult to break once it is, once it is established. Now, the mechanisms of injury in children vary by the age at injury. And the nature of brain damage that one you see is determined partly by the injury mechanisms. If you look at the neonates, it's mostly birth injury. And the commonest lesion is the subdural hematoma. In infants, the commonest cause of brain injury is non-accidental injury, which results in hypoxic injury. Sometimes infants have falls when they are carried and they have severe head injury. In toddlers, it's mostly falls resulting in fractures, extradural hematoma, subdural hematoma. And in the present day world, you have toddlers being involved in motor vehicle accidents while unprotected. We have seen often toddlers carried in the arms of the mother in the car, or toddlers straddling the, the motorcycle with the father. And when these children get involved in a motorcycle accident, you can have either concussion or severe head injury, diffuse injury, complex fractures, subdural hematoma, contusions, and sub traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage. So we have a wide spectrum of mechanisms of injury depending on the age. Now, there are two main mechanisms that cause brain damage. One is impact. That means at the moment the brain is hit, there's that damage. And then the brain undergoes acceleration, deceleration. That means if you are in a car and the car gets involved in a crash, there's deceleration of the brain. So that's the second type of injury. Now, these two types of injury are defined by specific biomechanical properties of the cranium, brain, and neck muscles in these young children. So that's what is important to realize. These two uh, mechanisms are impacted by what is specific for these young children. Now, if you take the size of the child, the smaller build itself make a child more vulnerable to have a head injury. If a car hits, it's more likely to hit the head than in an adult. And the head occupies a relatively large portion of the body compared to the adult. So it's more likely to get injured. In addition, in the child, the face is very poorly developed. Sinuses are very poorly developed. So there is no cushioning effect from a head injury. Unlike in the adult, where the face is well developed, the sinuses are well developed. In addition, in the child, the forehead is relatively more prominent than in the adult. So in a fall, it's more likely to get hit than in the adult where the face will hit. So these are unique structural properties in children that makes them more vulnerable. The skull in the very young child is thin. And in the infant, there are sutures. Now, these, these characteristics allow some degree of absorption of modest forces without fracture. And it can result in what you call a ping pong fracture, like in a ping pong ball. Or you can have extra dural hematoma without a fracture, which can happen in young children. But this thin skull increases the risk of penetrating injury. This is a young infant uh, who has had a penetrating injury from a pencil uh, held by one of the elder uh, siblings. So the thinner skull has a vulnerability to protect uh, penetrating injury. In addition, when you have a severe impact on a thin skull, the skull undergoes severe changes in shape without fracture. And that can result in a diffuse pattern of injury, even with a focal injury. And you may not see that in CT scan. Now, this is an experimental study on the infant brain, where a- Experimental as in, is in fake brain, I'm sure. In gel, in gel form. In, in gel form. Gel that is similar to physical properties to the brain. You know, you can make a gel that has similar physical properties to the brain. Okay. And study the mechanical effects of that. Because you can put sensors in the gel and study the pressure. Okay. Right? So when you study that, in the infant brain, there's a lot of spread of the, the force into the brain. Whereas when the brain has adult properties, the spread is much lower. So you can have much more severe injury with the, with the impact and of a diffuse form than in adult where it's a focal injury. 
Now, when you have a crush injury in the infant brain, in the infant skull, you can have fracture lines that extend diagonally across. And this can result in blunt cerebrovascular injury. So this can happen if the child is involved in a, in a motor vehicle accident or a heavy object falls on the, on the head of the child. So this is a uh, MRI showing uh, dissection of the internal intracarotid artery, thrombosis, and infarction of the middle cerebral uh, territory due to this uh, fracture running across. So that's one, one thing to think of when you have a crush injury of the skull. And this may be silent initially, but there's a risk of delayed thrombosis. So it may need preemptive CT or MR angiography. Now these complex patterns with crush injury are best shown by 3D CT. It shows exactly the kind of uh, fracture, complex fracture that one encounters. And 3D CT is also useful in children to differentiate a skull fracture from a vascular marking. So 3D CT is available in most scanners and you should make use of that to see the uh, infants with uh, head injury. We have also this rare lesion in young children where if you have a skull fracture with dural damage, then the CSF pulsations and the brain pulsations can gradually enlarge the fracture site, causing an enlarging skull fracture with time. So that's a rare but unique feature in young children. Now, the acceleration deceleration of the brain is much worse in a young child, increasing the risk of diffuse damage to the brain and to the vessels. This is because the head in the child is relatively heavier, achieving 72% of the adult weight by two years. And the neck muscles are poorly developed and there is increased movement at the cerv cervical joint. So there's great rocking motion of the head on the cervical spine, increasing the risk of acceleration, deceleration in the So if you look at an MRI of the brain in a young child, as I showed earlier, there's a hyper intensity in the white matter, showing there's a lot of water. Whereas in the adult, there is myelin and low intensity. So this heavy water content makes the brain heavier. And the poor myelinization makes the brain more fragile. And the brain has less developed connective tissue support. So these two features make the brain heavier and more fragile and more vulnerable to acceleration, deceleration injury. And the acceleration, deceleration injury often is underestimated by CT scan, unless it shows a small hemorrhage like this. Because most of the damage is microscopic or non hemorrhage So if you want to see uh, diffuse injury, you may have to resort to MRI scan, which shows the non-hemorrhagic lesions in flare sequences and these uh, blood sensitive sequences, susceptibly weighted sequences that show hemorrhage. So if you have a child who's unconscious and the CT scan is relatively normal, you may have to consider an MRI to show this uh, diffuse brain damage. Now, post-traumatic brain swelling is one of the most common types of pathology in young children. Often you see only this pathology. You see diffuse low density, loss of gray white matter, <clears throat> differentiation and compression of the ventricles. Now, most, in most cases, this is due to swelling of the cells itself. This can be innocuous and the child can be relatively well, or it can result in increased intracranial pressure and become clinically significant. So it's important to recognize this change. Now, Young children are <clears throat> at an increased risk for brain swelling because there's easy diffusion of excitotoxic neurotransmitters and their blood-brain barrier is more permeable. They are more vulnerable to hypoxia and hypotension and they have a more profound inflammatory response than adults. So these factors make brain swelling much more common and much more lethal in the young child. Now, extradural hematoma is relatively less common in children because the dura is tightly adherent to the skull and the middle meningeal artery is not embedded in bone till about four years. When it occurs, extradural hematoma is commonly of venous origin. And this is the typical posterior fossa extradural hematoma that you can result in a young child falling on the back of the head. And this blood will accumulate very slowly because it's venous. So the child can be relatively well and suddenly undergo late and catastrophic deterioration. So if you have a fall on the back of the head, this is something to recognize. Look for an occipital fracture. Look for the possibility of a delayed extraneural hematoma. 
Now, subdural hematomas are more common in young children because there's a relatively large CSO space and the brain is heavy and more deformable. So the brain sloshes in the, in the skull when you have a movement and that can tear these bridging veins. These bridging veins here resulting in a subdural hematoma. Now, with severe head injury, like after traffic accident, subdural hematoma will cause shift, brain swelling, and severe neurological impairment. Less commonly with a small subdural hematoma, you can have delayed brain swelling. So if you have a child who's relatively well with a thin subdural hematoma, you have to watch out for this delayed edema that can cause deterioration. How long will it usually last and uh, be the transition from the brain to the brain swelling? How long? Yes, from the you know from being relatively well to being that can vary. Usually it's 48 hours, but it can vary. It can vary depending on the mix of changes. You know, you can you, I'll I'll deal with one of those changes later. You can have sudden change of blood volume, causing increased pressure after head injury in children. The other problem with head injury is increased risk of damage to the upper cervical spine in children. Young children are much more likely to have upper cervical spine injury after uh, trauma. Because as I said earlier, the head is heavier. And there's increased movement in the vertebral joints because there's a large head to body ratio. And the ligaments are lax, neck muscles are immature. There's incomplete ossification of the vertebrae in the young child. And if you look at the cervical spine of a young child, the anterior bodies are wedged, relatively wedged, allowing freedom of movement. In the adult cervical spine, where the body is relatively square, if you look at the facet joints in a child, it's almost horizontal. So it doesn't prevent forward movement. Whereas in an adult, it's oblique. So it, it blocks. Uh, it, sorry. Oh. Sorry, just a moment. Okay, so in adult, there, there is resistance to cervical spine injury because of the shape of the vertebra and the, and the direction of the facet joint. Whereas in the young child, the young child is more vulnerable because there's relative anterior ridging of the vertebrae and the facet joints are relatively horizontal. So you can have a cord injury without any X-ray or CT scan changes because the brain, can, the cervical spine can sublux and return back and it will only cause a cord injury and cervical spine can look normal. What we call cervical spine injury without radiological abnormality or shivora. Now the fulcrum of movement in the cervical, high cervical spine injury is upper cervical spine till C4. So that's very important to recognize. So when you do a head CT for a severe head injury, it must include the cranial junction. It must come down to the C2 level so that you can detect this injury preemptively. So this is one of the characteristic changes you see when you come down, you have a retroclival hematoma. That's a clivus here. That's a posterior fossa and you have a hemorrhage just behind the clivus. When you see this, you must automatically suspect an upper cervical spine injury and resort to MRI scan where the hematoma is nicely shown and you can see ligamentous injury in the fat saturation. Uh, here is a damage to the ALR ligament. So one must suspect upper cervical spine injury and not wait for it to become clinically manifest. Now, when you have increase in intracranial pressure after traumatic brain injury, it's due to increase in either brain, blood, or CSF volume. Brain volume increases due to cellular swelling or hematoma. Blood volume increases due to vasodilatation, hyperemia, or loss of water regulation. Now, to detect evidence of increased ICP in the CT scan, one looks for this perimesencephalic system, CSF system around the brain stem. When you have increased pressure in the intracranial compartment, systems get compressed, become slit-like, and then become obliterated. But one problem in young children is that they can have a normal perimesencephalic system, but can have increased ICP. So you must watch out. Radiologists might say there is no increased ICP, but the child can have increased ICP with a normal system. That's one of the unique features in very young children. Now, most of this increased ICP in the early stages is due to cellular swelling, particularly in the uh, 24 hours. 
and young children have unmyelinated brain with the high water content, which makes swelling much more likely and much more life-threatening. Now, young children also have a higher normal blood volume. If you plot blood volume by age, the intraminal blood volume in normal child increases up to about five years and slowly tapers down to adult levels by about 12 years. So when you have a normal high blood volume, the child is much more vulnerable to rapid changes in blood volume after trauma. So that's why a child can deteriorate very fast because there can be a small change in blood volume already on a high blood volume and that can cause deterioration. So the CT appearance can change very rapidly in a child. Now, the secondary brain insults are also very common in the young because due to increased ICP, as I mentioned earlier, and you can have hypotension, loss of heart regulation, and spasm, hypoxia, hypotension, and seizures. So these are the causes of secondary brain injury. Now, when you look at intracranial pressure in infants and young children, when infants have open fontanel and lack sutures, they have the capacity to accommodate certain increase in intracranial volume, provided the volume increases very slow and modest. That capacity to accommodate volume is called intracranial compliance. But in young children, the ability for compliance is very limited. That's one thing to realize. So even a small increase of volume as much as 10 to 15 ml can cause a rapid rise of intracranial pressure. To show this, one has to look at what we call the pressure volume curve. That is intracranial pressure plotted against increased intracranial volume. Now in an adult, as volume increases, increases there is compensation by getting rid of CSF and uh, venous blood from the intracranial compartment. So the intracranial pressure initially does not go up with, with a volume increase. Then that capacity for compliance becomes gradually decreased. So the intracranial pressure starts to slowly go up. Then you have a final break point where everything fails and the intracranial pressure shoots up. So that's what you call the pressure volume curve in an adult. Whereas in a young child, the break point occurs much earlier than in adult, and the rise of intracranial pressure is much sharper. So children are much more vulnerable to increases of intracranial pressure than adult. Now the consequence of increased intracranial pressure is ischemia. Now the tolerance for increased intracranial pressure before ischemia occurs is much lower in a child. The child can tolerate only seven minutes of intracranial pressure more than 20 minutes millimeters mercury before ischemia occurs, compared to 37 minutes in the adult. So children have a high risk of increased ICP and a high risk of ischemic brain damage due to increased ICP. The children are also more vulnerable, young children, to extracranial injury. They can have multi-system injuries, intra-abdominal injuries, much more common than an adult. They have a potential for considerable blood loss, even with the scalp hematoma or intracranial hematoma. And about a third of children with severe head injury have hypotension with, without any extracranial blood loss. So that's one of the features of young children. They can have hypotension purely due to the head injury. No one knows why. Of course, they are more vulnerable to hypoxia because airway can easily get obstructed in young children. They have a smaller capacity, residual functional residual capacity, and limited capacity to increase tidal volume. So that's so far as vulnerability uh, of young children to head injury goes. Now I want to just deal uh, briefly about very young children who present with a minor head injury, a common presentation in the emergency department. What I'm talking of is a child who has transient loss of consciousness, maybe amnesia, maybe disoriented, with a glasscocoma scale score of 30 to 50. That is a child who's conscious and responsive. Now, when you look, say GCS 15, that's an alert child. GCS 14 is a drowsy or confused child. A GCS 13 means drowsy and confused. I hope you all don't have a GCS of 13. <laughs> not yet, not yet. Give us another <laughs> two hours. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, when you look at GCS 13, that is a high risk group. The risk of injury in CT is over 20%. And risk of clinically significant injury is about 5 to 10%. Now, those children need a CT. There is no argument about that. 
But the issue is with children who have GCS 14 and 15. Most of them have innocent injury. There's nothing to worry. But 4 to 7% have a visible injury on the CT and about less than 1% require neurosurgical intervention. So these are a large group of whom a minority will have significant injury. So that is the critical. So the challenge is to identify those at risk, at this risk, in a cost-effective and safe manner. You cannot CT scan every child who comes. So you need to risk stratify these children so as to identify which children need a, a CT scan and which children will not. So when you look at brain injury by clinical significance in minor head injury, you have an entity called clinically important traumatic brain injury. That means injury that is likely to result in death or neurosurgical intervention like craniotomy, ICV monitoring, ventricular drainage, depressed fracture, or dural ring back, or which results in intubation or ventilation or hospital admission two nights or more. So that is one category called clinically important traumatic brain injury. Then you have the second category where you have a visible abnormality in the CT, but that does not require intervention and does not produce an immediate threat to the life of the child. Those are small hematomas, contusions, edema, fractures, but there's a possibility of long-term sequelae in these children in cognition or behavior. So it's important to recognize and warn the parents. But the majority of the children have innocuous injury. So we have these three categories of minor head injury in very young children. Now, the problem with neurological evaluation of very young children, particularly pre-verbal pre -verbal children, less than two years, that you can have significant brain injury with a normal neurological examination. The child can look awake, can have spontaneous eye opening, can be moving the limbs with a very serious brain injury. So it's very deceptive. Clinical evaluation in these young children can be deceptive. And because they cannot talk, it's difficult to evaluate them neurologically. They do not localize readily to pain. And they can have primitive responses in the brain stem, even with serious brain injury. So in these children, if you use an adult glasocoma score that can underestimate injury severity. So we are expected to use a pediatric coma scale. I know it's difficult to memorize, but that is what is advised. And what is the most important variable here is a verbal response. That is the most likely to change in these young children because they can have eye opening and spontaneous movement even with severe brain injury. But their verbal response change is very important. So one must learn to use, if you are looking at children, one must learn to use this pediatric coma scale and, and specialize on recognizing verbal response changes. So exclusion of clinically important injury requires the CT. CT is accurate and fast. The problem is that sometimes in young children, it is difficult to keep them still and that can result in movement artifacts that affect the reliability of the scan. And if you give sedation, neurological examination becomes more difficult and there's a possibility of respiratory depression, hypoxic brain damage, need for ventilation. And there's a small risk of radiation-induced malignancy, leukemia and brain cancer in very young children. The absolute risk is very small, but if you keep on repeating the CT scan, the risk becomes significant. But because the risk of serious brain injury in this age group is small, you know, you know, child with an innocuous injury, it, the risk of cancer may be more than the risk of brain injury. So that's something you have to recognize. And that's something you have to tell the parents that a CT scan is not just innocuous investigation. It has to be taken seriously in young children. So what are the variables we use in the risk stratification? One is age. The risk increases with decreasing age, especially neonates less than three months. Then you have high risk mechanism of injury, motor vehicle crash, pedestrian or bicyclist suck, falls more than three feet in less than two years, more than five feet in more than two years, fall when the infant is carried or head struck by a high impact object. Then you have subtle changes in mentation, which often only parents will know. Child looks agitated, child looks drowsy, child is questioning repeatedly, child is slow to respond. So you have to check with the parents. Parent observation become very important in these children. And then a hematoma in the scalp can be significant, as I told earlier, particularly if it is not in the frontal region or evidence of a brain basal fracture, ENT bleeding or CSF leak. 
Now, there are also clusters of other features. By a single feature alone may not be significant, but if you have a combination of these features, then also there may be a higher risk of intracranial injury. Brief loss of consciousness, headache, vomiting, frontal hematoma, a child older than three months. Now, the Canadian guidelines are the established rule for risk stratification. And they stratify the risk into high risk, intermediate risk, and low risk. And give factors for children less than two years, pre verbal more than two years. And they identify what is the risk of clinically important brain injury and what is the recommendation. So if you look at the high risk group, glasgoma score is 14. And they have altered mental status. In less than two years, there is signs of skull fracture. More than two years, signs of basal fracture. Risk of clinically important brain injury is 4%. They must have a CT scan. So that's one category. Second category is intermediate. That means they have severe mechanism of injury, loss of consciousness. In young children, a scalp hematoma that is occipital, parietal, or temporal, and a child not, not acting normally as per parent. And in older children, vomiting and headache. Now, in these children, risk of brain injury is about 1%. These children, there could be an alternate between CT scan or observation, depending on your clinical judgment and the facilities available. If you don't have facilities for observation, you may have to undergo a CT scan. So that's the alternate. And, and then the importance of scalp hematoma is highlighted by my earlier experimental uh, diagram that with a severe scalp impact, you can have a significant brain injury in a very young child. So that's why scalp hematoma becomes important uh, risk factor in these very young children. Then you have the low risk where you have none of these features. And the risk of clinically important brain injury is less than 0.05%. They don't need a CT scan. Their risk is lower than the risk of CT-induced malignancy. That's very important to recognize. You must not just do CT scans on young children without reason. But sometimes you may have to consider CTs. They have multiple findings, worsening symptoms, infant less than three months, and by your own experience. And sometimes parents may insist on a CT scan, and sometimes you may have no choice. That is a practical problem that you cannot correct. The exceptions to this rule are if you suspect non-accidental injury. There is no argument. You have to do a CT scan. And in children who have VP shunt or coagulopathy, also you have to do a CT scan irrespective of whatever risk factors you have. So when you come to head injury in young children, we have thing called neuroplasticity. That means the capacity to compensate for a traumatic brain injury. Now, the rest of the brain connections can compensate for what you have lost. So that is what you call compensation. The problem in very young children is the brain injury is mostly diffuse and it hits these compensatory uh, networks. So the child has less compensation available after diffuse injury. When you are breaking up. That's why children hold on, hold do badly on. after uh, head injury. Can you just repeat, please? Because you, yeah, go back to your previous slide, please. Because you, you were lagging and we couldn't hear you. Okay, this one? No, the the next one. This one. Okay, that's right. So neuroplasticity is the ability of a child to recover after brain injury. That means plastic. Plastic. That means you have a focal injury here. The fibers that are all around it can compensate for this injury. So that's what you expect in a child. The problem with these very young children is they mostly have diffuse brain damage that knocks off these compensatory mechanisms. So that's why they have a worse outcome from a head injury. Did I get it right? Yes. Okay. Just, that just now you so, were a bit laggy. Yeah. The final message is you must understand unique aspects of pediatric brain injury, both the physics and the pathology. The process of brain maturation affects the response to trauma. And then children are very vulnerable to secondary brain insults. So I hope I have conveyed this message uh, in this short uh, presentation. Uh, this is one of my hobbies. Oh my God, so cute. Yeah. It's the mom, right? Not eating yeah. the child, yeah. right? Yeah. The, the young, the, when they are very young, the mother translocates them frequently because to avoid other predators from attacking the children. The, Smaller cubs. 
So I managed to catch one of these. So, okay. You must have some okay. madness that takes you away from work. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we will take questions. It is a very interesting talk. I would have never thought that a child, a child would actually uh, be more vulnerable to, um, you know, head injuries compared to an adult. And, um, and yet, I, I just want to send the message across to the public who are watching this, that how after this talk, it's so really so important to actually the child on the babysit, uh, ensure that the, you know, the safety measures are taken by putting the child on the safety, you know, child seat and making sure they are strapped up. Because I had, um, I was uh, a medical student in HUKM and there was once a mom actually drove with a baby, a few months old, on her lap. Okay, while she was driving and then she met with the accident and the baby died on the spot because it was flung. Right. Uh, so when you speak of this, I think back on that time when the baby died on the spot. It's just too sad. Right. So any questions, please? I know it's a bit um, very detailed and for the lesser Doctors like us who are not neurosurgeons, <laughs> we may not know what to ask. Even I am like trying my best to think of a question, but I can't because it was well presented, very easy to understand for people like us. Um, and uh, too deep, ask a question. Anyone at all? Come on. Hold on. Give them time. <laughs> Okay, while we are thinking of what to ask, I'm sorry I got the date wrong. Next week is not a CPD point. So um, it's next two weeks. <laughs> so anyone, any questions? Let me see. No, no one has any questions to ask. They're usually a very interactive crowd, Ben. Uh, right. Your lecture is um, two... Too well done and uh, <laughs> too difficult for us to ask anything. But I really yeah, I, I enjoyed think, your lecture. I'm just, I think uh, anything is a, a carry home message as yes. long as because the, 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 your audience will look at head injury first before we see them. And it's very yes. important to understand our thinking so that they act accordingly. They can preempt damage to the brain. And the, and the vulnerability of the brain makes it very important that the person who sees first acts the proper way. So that's yeah, the, especially that's my the GPs and the emergency doctors right. and uh, doctors who have just graduated and not sure how to handle a child with a recent uh, head injury. But we have a question and every time once it starts with one question, it will all start rolling. Right. So easy ask, easy as I-Z-Y-X-I-Z-Y. I -Z -Y. If a child sustained basal skull fracture, is right. there any indication for surgery? Basal skull fracture itself does not require surgery unless it causes a CSA bleed that does not stop. Basal skull fracture can just cause bleeding only from the nose, throat, or ears. But if, in addition to bleeding, there's a CSA bleed. That means there's a dural tear. Usually, this CSA bleed stops spontaneously. But if it doesn't spot, stop spontaneously after about a week or so, then you have to investigate and maybe do corrective surgery. That's a minority of basal skull fractures. Good. I'm glad we have one question. That was a very good question. And if you do a surgery for basal skull fracture and you do it for to repair the dura, dura do you actually also repair the basal skull fracture? Is that not really? Way? Not really. We can do the repair nowadays mostly endoscopically, and you can seal the seal the opening with sealant, I see. so and that you don't have to do open surgery unless there's a compound depress fracture in the frontal region or something. Okay, please enlighten me when you do the endoscopy surgery. 
uh, through wish for a man, wish yeah. uh, so, orifice. So, so uh, if, if you have a CSF leak from the anterior skull base, you can do rhinoscopy and repair it. It's Akina who was with us for the first time here. Uh, she says, hi, Dr. Ben. The hi. risk... The risk stratification just now, is it yeah. in regards of CT scan alone or does it in X-ray look for fracture as well? Actually, X-ray alone is very, very little use unless you are suspecting a penetrating injury or a depressed fracture. I think if, if you really need to exclude brain injury, you have to do a CT scan. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't focus on X-rays unless the child is well and you suspect a penetrating injury or, you know, uh, that's, a, that's the main reason. Ben, you know, with a child, let's say it's a crying child. Yeah. Uh, how do we then do a CT scan without sedation? If we do and we give sedation, how do we then assess the child? The, yeah. the deterioration is rapid. Yeah. I, I think... I think there is an option to observe the child in a high dependency unit with regular neurological observations. And if the child has an innocuous injury, the child will recover within 24 hours, or 12 to 24 hours. Whereas if the child doesn't recover, then you can take the option of taking the risk of sedation or, or um, intubation and CT scan. So that, that is a compromise rather than to just give sedation to every child. Particularly okay. the big hospitals will have, yeah, we have been a, right. observation, you know. Observation first. So well, it's an option without just subjecting them to CT scan. But if you have those risk factors, then you have no argument. If you have high risk, you have to do the CT scan. Whatever, whatever means. And like I say, once one question comes, we have now plenty to entertain. Yeah. Says, if a, as a GP we get a baby brought with a fall from a height or while being carried, a baby looks good and crying, no swelling, should we send to a hospital for observation? But as I told, in the very young child, pre verbal child, less than two years, fall from being while being carried is a high risk mechanism. So already the child is coming to a high risk group those children will definitely have to be uh, sent to a hospital. They can decide whether to admit or not. The old child is less vulnerable. Then the old child will be able to assess neurologically much better. Old child will be able to obey commands and respond so that you can assess the glossocoma scale much better. It's a pre-verbal child who often falls while being carried. You know. I hope it answers the question. G Link asks, how do we know? Sorry, hold on. How do we know if it, an infant is confused? You cannot. If you are pre verbal, you won't. But that's why I said the parent's observation is very important, the mother's observation. The mother can tell you, Look, my child is not normal. My child is slow. She's not reacting to me the way she normally does. That's very important. You must not dismiss the parents' observations in those children. Because you cannot assess confusion in a small child. Yes, that's very true. So Lee Sin uh, asks, how long should a patient be put under cerebral protection after a traumatic brain injury? Right. I think it will depend on the nature of the injury. And Say, if you have a very, very large acute subdural hematoma with massive swelling and shift and you do a craniotomy and evacuation or craniectomy and evacuation, you may have to give protection for several days. If you have a modest extradural hematoma or subdural hematoma without need for surgery, then after 24 hours, you can reduce the sedation and assess the patient. The patient is waking up, you can extubate the patient. So it depends on the nature of the severity of the injury. There's a spectrum of severity. Very severe injuries that require very prolonged protection. And the, the middle range that require maybe 24, 48 hours and, and removal of sedation to assess the patient. Healing again asks, is bradycardia considered a sign of intracranial bleed in infant as well? It is. 
it is, but it may not always be there. Infants, infants can cope with the tachycardia. Oh, they can cope better. No, they can cone, they can undergo coning, brainstem herniation, even with the tachycardia. They may not oh, show I bradycardia. See, I see. They may not so always it, show bradycardia. So they may not have what we call the pushing reflex. No, they may not have. They may not have. I wouldn't wait for the pushing reflex. Of course. Yeah. Oh, I was going to ask something, but okay. I want to ask you, you know, when there's a, the skull fracture or let's say there's a bleed and you need to evacuate, you do, you drill it, right? You make a craniotomy. You make a craniotomy. Then, what if a part of the the skull is is gone? How do you cover that then? We have titanium mesh. Sorry? Titanium mesh. Titanium so mesh. You can cut okay. and fit into the defect immediately. Oh, I see. Yeah. Or I if you if you if you uh, if you uh, leave the defect and let the patient recover, you can uh, build a cut. Custom built titanium processes to fit the defect perfectly by computer modeling. Oh, so it'll be like your skull. Yeah, you can model the frontal region and, and to a titanium uh, processes. Like six million dollar man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, titanium, huh? Yeah. Why don't you? They use plastic. They used to use plastic, but now titanium is much more inert and much, much easier, much easier. And uh, will it be safer than uh, your own bony skull? Of course, the bony skull is always better, but if you can't get the it's bony better. skull, okay. <laughs> this is the next alternative. Okay, so Natia asked, um, hi doctor, when is a burr hole indicated? Burr hole we do for chronic subdural hematoma, which is liquid. So you can drill a hole and let it out. But for clotted blood, you cannot evacuate clotted blood through a burr hole. It requires a craniotomy. Okay. And can you just tell us what's the difference? Burr hole means a single drill hole. Okay. Craniotomy means multiple drill holes that you connect and raise a flap. So okay. you close a large area of brain and take the clot out. I get it now. So I've never seen actually any neurosurgical procedures before. Anyone else? Any more questions? Okay. So we have done very well. I think uh, our audience really got very interested in what you taught us. And there were even more learning things to learn from the questioning. So with that, I think we we'll thank you, Ben. Thank I'll you. see thank you, you one of these days again. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for giving me the chance to. Yes. And then maybe next time we can have another talk. Yeah. And uh, yeah. thank you everybody for okay. coming to this webinar. I'll see you next week. Next week is actually um we're having a session with a lawyer. Okay, lawyer. to talk about medical legal aspect of things. Uh, and this lawyer is was also a doctor. Right. He has a medical degree and uh, has decided to actually change his career to become a lawyer. Clever, okay, thank a, you, guys. Clever man, a clever man. Yes, yes, a clever man. <laughs> we don't know. He might be regretting it. Next week, we will ask him. Okay, okay. See you. Bye, guys. Bye, bye everybody. Bye, bye.